For the second lecture today, uh, in your last lecture before Thanksgiving, we're going to talk about uh, the clinical microbiologic aspects of TB and other mycobacterial infections. TB uh, is important, as you might imagine, uh, although the number of cases are decreasing in the United States. Uh, TB will, is a disease that will burn you. Uh, it will really burn you uh, big time. And, and I continue to get burned by TB, uh, mainly because it uh, can be a subtle diagnosis we tend not to think of it, and the organism, being a slowly growing organism, is not one that we're really geared up to deal with in our hospital or healthcare system in which the modus operandi seems to be stat, do it now. Although there are, to be sure, some, uh, some evolving technologies to deal with TB using the polymerase chain reaction and other technologies. Worldwide, it's a huge problem. Arguably the most uh, common cause of death due to infectious diseases worldwide after, I suppose, diarrhea in little infants in developing countries. About nearly four million cases a year in the world, most of the deaths in developing countries. Issues today include multiple drug resistance, and this has become a rampant problem in uh, certain populations, particularly uh, sub-Saharan Africa, and in this country, in, uh, in homeless people and HIV-infected people. In AIDS patients, the presentations are often atypical. As it turns out, the, uh, the typicality, if that's the word, of tuberculosis varies directly with your CD4 lymphocyte count. In other words, as the CD4 count becomes very, very low, your immunity very low, TB lacks its classic expression as a cavitary upper lobe disease because you need intact macrophages, intact T cell immunity to form the cavities and the usual expressions of the disease. Spread in the hospitals is of major concern to us. On my service about four years ago, I'm, uh, uh, maybe five or six years ago, I'm embarrassed to say, uh, we didn't recognize a case of TB. The chest X-ray was entirely normal. Four residents converted to a skin test, and a medical student got active TB as a result. So it is an occupational hazard for you, less so than for your predecessors. Uh, and people who, who are born elsewhere, it's a problem. TB tends to be a southeastern disease. In South Carolina, you know, we have this expression, Thank God for Mississippi, right? <laughs> the number of cases had a uh, blip in the early years of the AIDS epidemic and with the change in the case definition, and then has begun to fall again in the United States. It's now around maybe 15,000 cases a year of tuberculosis in the United States. And the uh, percentage of cases due to people who were born elsewhere in the United States has been increasing the overall number of cases of tuberculosis. So I think of immigrants looking at ethnic populations in TB, white, non-Hispanic, the rate is very low. Black, non-Hispanic, it becomes much higher. Native Americans, Hispanics, Asians, Pacific Islanders, very high. So, uh, so let's review some of the waterfront of TB. TB, like Pseudomonas and a few other organisms, is a strict aerobe. It has to have oxygen. It prefers a high PO2. It, it, it grows very slowly. And of of great clinical importance is the idea that by spontaneous mutation, about one in 100,000 to one in 10 million cells is going to be resistant to a given drug. And to, to two more cells, 
to two or more drugs, one in every 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 12 cells, just by spontaneous mutation. So that treating TB, the principle has evolved that it really is a race against time. Now, by analogy with TB, I was opposed uh, in the early and late 1980s after AZT came out for HIV to treating everybody at the first uh, diagnosis of HIV disease because I felt that by analogy with TB, resistance would become inevitable. And sure enough, that turned out to be a bad strategy that uh, folks did get resistance pretty soon because, as you know, HIV uh, uh, mutates about one every 10,000 uh, base pairs. It slips up. And this is why when streptomycin came out in 1948 and was used as monotherapy, it turned out the resistance developed fairly rapidly. The basics for TB, uh, it's uh, one of a complex of organisms, M. tuberculosis, M. bovis, and M. africanum, but this is the only one of real clinical importance, transmitted by airborne droplet nuclei, the idea being that when you cough and you uh, expel this thing, the uh, water evaporates, leaving this little tiny droplet nucleus surrounded by a little a tiny bit of water maybe that can then uh, slip right through the hairs of the brisci in your nose and get on down to your lungs. And the people who transmit it are people who are coughing up AFB and have tend to be positive smears. And it's said that between 5 and 15 percent of people with TB will develop active disease within two years. The usual figure is 5 percent. The usual figure is that if you're infected with TB, you have about a 10 percent lifetime risk of developing clinical disease, of which about half of that risk will be in the first year, which underlines the strategy to treat recent converters, that is, someone who has recently converted their test. TB tends to be a disease of the disadvantaged. Anyone can get TB, but uh, people who've been inmates, people who come from other countries, people who come from low-income inner-city type groups tend to be the ones that get it, although it can happen in anyone, and infected persons at risk of Increased, disease, increased risk of disease in little children, people with chronic diseases, immunosuppressed, and people who have HIV disease. Am I going too fast? A lot of this should be by way of review for you. Also by way of review, the idea that the bacillus infects macrophages, which process the antigen, which pass their information along to lymphocytes, which make lymphokines, which retain macrophages and, uh, and, and also commit certain lymphocytes to do nothing their entire lives but to travel around the body looking for MTB antigen, right? And this explains the positive tuberculin skin test, the delayed hypersensitivity reaction. That you've got lymphocytes that just, that's all they do is go around in surveillance for TB. And as it turns out, to back up what I said about HIV, you need to have, to get the characteristic lesion of pulmonary TB, the cavity, you have to have activated macrophages making these enzymes that can destroy tissue. And uh, some more of this stuff here about cytokines, interleukin-1 with fever, interleukin-6, hyperglobulinemia, tumor necrosis factor alpha, killing the organisms, granuloma formation, fever, weight loss, et cetera, et cetera. And the organism strategy is to interrupt intracellular killing. This is the phagosome, phagolysosome, and the idea is that MTB is able to uh, interrupt the process of intracellular killing and thus survive in the phagolysosome inside of macrophages more or less indefinitely. Uh, there were, uh, we'll get back to some implications of that. This is the usual classical 
a pathogenesis of TB. Uh, you get it by inhalation. Uh, I got it myself. I converted my skin test by doing an autopsy on an old fellow at the Johns Hopkins Hospital who died of chronic lung disease. And, uh, you know, I was holding up the lung, trying to decide whether this is pneumococcus or pseudomonas, et cetera. And after I finished the autopsy, the medical resident came down and said, oh, by the way, we just learned that he has a positive AFB culture. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> He's been in the hospital a long time, you know. So about six months later, I was doing a medical internship, and surgery resident and I put skin tests on each other, and mine formed a swapping lesion. On the day of infection, the organism, we inhale it, and it goes down to, usually for aerodynamic reasons, if we walk around in the upright position, most of our ventilation goes to the lower lung field. Just kind of breathe in and out, and you can feel that what's getting the most ventilation is the lower part of your lung. The organism then begins to multiply, it has a good time in the lower part of the lung. If you had a chest X-ray at this time, it might show a little tiny infiltrate, but really you feel nothing. You're asymptomatic. It goes to the regional lymph nodes. When calcified and showing up on an X-ray years later, this combination is called the Gone complex after a guy named Anton Gone. Multiplies, and then at about four to five weeks, it's still multiplying. It gets up into the what? In the lethal lymphatics? Who can remember from your gross anatomy the birds in the thorax? Excuse me? What are the birds in the thorax? Sure, the, 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 the vagus, the azagus, the uh, esophagus, and the thoracic duct, right? So it gets in the thoracic duct and, and then into your bloodstream, right? The thoracic duct enters the bloodstream where? Yeah, where the subclavian artery comes off the aorta. And, uh, and it goes around your bloodstream. And you may have nothing but just feel draggy or have a little mild flu-like illness. It goes around the body during this time. A few people during this period will develop hematogenous miliary tuberculosis. They'll develop these little tiny lesions that we'll show you later all over the body. Most people will not, but a few people will get miliary tuberculosis. It's during this time, between day zero and about six to eight weeks, that your tuberculin skin test becomes positive. You, you, your lymphocytes wake up. They be, become attuned to what's going on. A war takes place in your body. And uh, so that... At this point, you're starting to mop up what was down here. You're mopping up what was here, still multiplying here. You can go on here to what's called post-primary tuberculosis. This can win out and form active tuberculosis, but more commonly, the body takes care of this too. The question arises, why is the apex of the lung a favored site? Why do the macrophages uh, with their up there fail to take care of the organism? Why does the organism stay there in, in, in its phagolysosomes more or less indefinitely? Excuse me? Yeah, there are two explanations, and both of you gave uh, partial explanations for that. One uh, said it's less ventilated, and the other said it's less perfused, right? When you said less perfused and you said less, said what? More ventilated? Apex? No. As it turns out, as it turns out, both up. Uh, as you go from the uh, in the upright position, as you go from the bottom to the top, both. Ventilation and perfusion decrease, but perfusion decreases more than ventilation. So the ratio of ventilation to perfusion is highest at the top of the lung. In other words, perfusion essentially goes to zero, so that these little capillaries at the 
top of the lung are virtually closed. And so that, there are two corollaries. One is an obligate aerobe. Paradoxically, even though ventilation is a lot less than it is at the bottom of the lung, the PO2 tends to be as high as at the top of the lung because of the VQ ratio is, is higher, okay? The, and the other explanation is that macrophages don't get in much because of the capillaries are essentially closed. Uh, a, a, a pearl that a professor told me one time is that tuberculosis is rare in people with mitral stenosis because in, in mitral stenosis, the, uh, the blood is going to dam up behind the left atrium so you're going to get more perfusion there. In fact, in mitral stenosis, you see what's called cephalization of blood flow where the, uh, on, on the x-ray where the uh, pulmonary uh, vasculature is more prominent up at the top, cephalization of the blood flow. So for those two explanations, uh, the ones that are usually given, the high oxygen tension and the, and the poor perfusion, why it favors the top of the lung. And so what happens is you develop a Simon focus at one year where it's really been a successful mop-up operation, but you still have this band of, shall we say, gorillas or terrorist cells uh, at the, uh, use a bad analogy, uh, at the top of the lung. And, and you set up the conventional thinking along this line. It's, it's like a lot of the concepts is being revised, uh, and this gets to the problem that you've heard that uh, half of what we're teaching in medical school is wrong. The problem is we don't know which half. You set up this lifelong host parasite relationship, and eventually you fail to contain the organisms so they come out and react and reactivate. And so the usual classic TB is an upper lobe disease, cafeteria disease. And these just, this. The slides just tell you what I've just told you. The residue of the primary infection, the GOAN complex, these calcified peripheral foci, and the Simon focus at the apex of the lung. And uh, there's a, an x-ray technique called the apical lordotic film in which you, have, you stand like this in front of the machine to get the clavicles out of the way, and you can see a little fibrous cap at the top of the lung. That may be all you have to show for it. Now, I learned these two things uh, from one of my mentors, a great chest physician when I was in residency, on the importance of that salmon focus at the top of the lung. If humans didn't have apices of their lungs, which of course is impossible, right? We couldn't not have a top, right? If we didn't have apices of the lungs, the tubercle bacillus would not have survived as a human pathogen. The second was that once the Simon focus is formed, you're going to die of TB if something else doesn't get you first. It turns out that's probably wrong, that uh, a guy named William Stead in Arkansas studied TB in nursing homes and found that a lot of people, by doing tuberculin tests in nursing homes, a lot of people do actually eventually rid themselves of their TB and, and are, are hence vulnerable to uh, second infections of TB. As I mentioned to you, during the initial year of infection, the, the risk of developing active disease is about 5%, thereafter about 5% lifetime. This gets you into a nosological question. What do we mean by the nosology of disease? The concepts of disease, terminology, there's a whole field out there in, in the interface of philosophy and medicine. What do we mean when we talk about disease? That's a, that's a long conversation because a lot of what we call disease is really socially determined, right? What we call disease, so that's a different kind. Con- it, it can be tough. I mean, if your tuberculin skin test is positive, the question is, you, you ask me, do, do I have tuberculosis? That's what you ask me. Say, so, yes, you do have tuberculosis. You are, technically speaking, you're tuberculous hyphen infected, comma, no evidence of disease. You're tuberculous infected, and the conversation is you have living tubercle bacilli in the top of your lung. But we're not going to tattoo a red snapper on your forehead or anything. Okay? 
It means you, you have disease. Again, it now seems to studies by Stead, now it seems that a lot of people outlive their TB. If you're HIV infected, the risk of TB is about 7 to 10% per year. That figure probably needs to be re re revised downwards in the heart era. Insights from genotyping tuberculosis species obtained recently now seems that uh, it was previously thought, thought that 90% of TB cases in industrialized countries came from reactivation. Now in urban areas, maybe recent transmission causes up to half of the cases. The key to understanding a lot about TB is the cavity, cavity that forms in the lungs. This is a pivotal event in TB. Without treatment, the mortality from cavitary TB is about 90%. And before the advent of streptomycin in 1948, followed mercifully by the introduction of INH in 1952, everything that we did was aimed at closing cavities. This is why there were TB sanatoria in which you sat around just lying in bed most of the time. Okay, So you were just resting, so you weren't ventilating the top of your lung very much. Because if you go out and exercise or, you know, you play a point guard for Walford, right, you're going to be exercising and you're going to be ventilating that top of, of the lung that you normally don't use a whole lot. We, they did, they collapsed lungs at artificial pneumothorax. They said, hey, we can, and they'd line you up and they put a tube in your chest and let all the air out and collapse your lung. Or they put balls of wax in your chest to kind of sock it in. Everything was aimed at closing the cavity. To show you some pictures of cavitary TB, this would be a chest X-ray with lots of cavities on it and a lot of fibrosis and scarring. And to differentiate this by, from, say, a, an acute pneumonia, you want serial chest X-rays, obviously, but it, it sort of has a, a hard, chronic appearance that you get a feel for. You notice that this lung is not normal either. There's some stuff going on there. This shows a diagram of where the cavities were in 204 consecutive cases. And notice that they tend to be in the top of the lung, mainly posteriorly, apex of the lung posteriorly, 204 cases with cavities. Some, of course, having a lot more than one. This is a CT scan. Now the uh, Imaging procedure of choice. Notice that this lung, compared to that one, seems to be smaller. It's contracted. The fibrous scar tissue is contracting. It note the presence of multiple thick wall cavities here. But the cavity can be thin walled, and when uh, it turns out that even heal cavities are unstable, and the reason they're unstable is that by definition, since they're part of the lung you're going to have airways or bronchi that go into them, at least potentially. So at these points, they're unstable. And the walls of cavities, we, we talked about how 1 in 10 to the 5 to 10 to the 7 bacilli are resistant to one organism. And I think the figure that I gave you is 1 in 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10 was resistant to 2. Well, guess what? The walls contain up to 10 to the, 10 to the 11 bacilli per gram. So you can see right there that you are going to have an occasional bug that's going to be resistant to two or more drugs by spontaneous mutation and thus have a selective advantage for survival. Cavity sinus where the bronchi penetrate, open cavities can persist for years, constantly draining the organism into the rest of the tree, so you get to the bronchial tree, causing endobronchial spread, causing this thing to, to go throughout your lungs so that you could eventually smother to death. Who was this fellow? He wrote, O Attic Form, Fair Attitude of Breed, and it continues uh, on and on, said, Truth is beauty, beauty is truth, that is all you know on earth and all you need to know. Good! John Keats, and the title of it is, Are you an English major? That's good. John Keats was a medical student, coughed up blood, said, this is my death warrant, died of tuberculosis. Large literature on the association of tuberculosis and 
creative genius. Uh, all sorts of people. Chopin had tuberculosis, for example. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson, long list. And the, uh, the tall, thin woman with the long neck, kind of a tragic figure in, in uh, art and so on and so forth, had uh, tuberculosis. So what well, used to be the romantic thing to die from, now it's probably coronary artery disease, but uh, at any rate. And there was a, a very nice letter to the editor of a journal many years ago about comparing plague and, and plaque, talking about the analogy between TB and coronary artery disease, that uh, there was a time when TB was like coronary disease is now. There were special hospitals for it. There were special technologies for it in, in which you had uh, surgeons, for example, who were like uh, urologists. They looked through these little tiny scopes, thoracoscopes, and would, would snip away the adhesions that formed. Pleural adhesions is called pleurodesis because the adhesions were keeping the cavities from closing and the lung from collapsing. All these specialized things that were done, special diets to da 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 da, whole industries about TB. Uh, and all of that became obsolete with the introduction of chemotherapy. So the, the, the overarching concept here is how we have these halfway technologies in medicine. Someday, perhaps, we'll find an easy pre prevention or even cure for coronary disease, and all this technology of you know, heart caths, et cetera, et cetera, will become obsolete, because when you think about it, these really are halfway technologies. Complications of pulmonary TB, typically one has fever and night sweats, and when you ask somebody about night sweats, did you get up and change your pajamas? If it, the sweats are so bad that you got up and changed your bed clothes, then that's significant. Weight loss, anemia. You can die from a pulmonary hemorrhage. You can have a massive hemoptysis from several different mechanisms. It can progress and smother you. Rarely you can develop acute respiratory distress syndrome. Secretion of uh, inappropriate secretion of antidiuretic hormone leads to low serum sodium. Those are some of the things. So that's pulmonary tuberculosis. Any questions? Pass we now to extra pulmonary tuberculosis. About 10% of all cases of TB are outside the lungs. And this is a very diverse uh, group of syndromes. And for uh, in thinking about them, uh, I like to divide them into three different groups. The first is disseminated or miliary TB, which I've already kind of gone over with you conceptually, which is after infection, the organism spreading around your body by hematogenously and setting up shop all over, causing little tiny uniform uh, lesions that have been likened to millet seeds. Uh, I think I have a slide of a millet seed, hence the term miliary. Cirrhosal TB, TB of certain anatomic spaces and cavities, tuberculous pleurisy, tuberculous pericarditis, tuberculous arthritis, uh, tuberculous uh, uh, peritonitis, and uh, and tuberculosis, which did I leave out, uh, meningitis. And the idea there, which has been best shown for tuberculous meningitis and also tuberculous pleurisy, is that you have a, somebody who is tuberculin positive and you put tuberculin antigen in that space and you basically like putting a tuberculin skin test or PPD on a cellophane membrane and the whole space becomes whopping inflammation. So it's really a, a mixture of both infection and immune response, but primarily the latter that's going on there and, and causing a lot of damage. There was experiments uh, done by a guy named Patterson in England in the 1920s in which he took two populations of guinea pigs. He made one tuberculin positive and left the other tuberculin negative, and then he injected tubercle bacilli into their pleural spaces. The ones who were tuberculin negative died of disseminated miliary TB. Uh, and had very little fluid in the chest. The ones who were tuberculin positive, on the other hand, survived much better, but they developed large pleural effusions, telling you something. So we've got disseminated TB, we've got this concept of cirrhosal TB, TB of a, of a membrane or space, the pleural space, the uh, subarachnoid space, the pericardial space, the peritoneal cavity, and the synovial space in the joints. And then tuberculosis of solid organs, TB of the kidney, 
which can generate a urinary TB, which can then spread down through the urinary tract with a fairly common thing in the uh, pre-chemotherapy era was tuberculous salpingitis in women, it causes sterility, uh, osteomyelitis, TB of the bone, TB of the adrenal glands, that was a classic cause of adrenal insufficiency, TB of lymph nodes and elsewhere. This is miliary TB on a chest X-ray. It looks like a snowstorm. See that? Diffuse infiltrate, think miliary TB. And these are, I went down to a health food store and bought some millet seeds, and indeed, uh, miliary TB, an autopsy or biopsy or whatever, this is what it looks, sort of looks, looks like, these individual lesions that you see here, miliary TB. And it's a tough diagnosis to make. Suffice it to say, you may occasionally find uh, something on examination that will help you a lot, but you just have to keep looking, and oftentimes you require biopsies and sometimes a therapeutic trial. And it can be a cause of dwindles in an older person, uh, just not doing well, losing weight. My mama might have cancer, whatever. And so sometimes just a trial of TB drugs may be what you need. Uh, this was a fellow who lived in St. Matthews, had been a farmer all of his life, uh, came in, had this lesion. They said, you got cancer, we need to operate, take out your colon. He said, I'm not going to oper be operated on as he goes home. Come, comes back in with bowel obstruction, comes to surgery for his napkin ring, uh, carcinoma of the colon, and lo and behold, it's TB. He had tuberculosis, shown here. Histologic finding, of course, is this multinucleated giant cell called a Langhans giant cell, uh, as opposed to uh, the foreign body type of polykaryocytosis, to use a big word, with the small round cells, which are lymphocytes, frequency of, of extrapulmonary sites, lymph nodes, first pleura, GU tract, bony joints, meninges. Peritoneum. By no means should you memorize that list. Just remember that TB can infect these different sites. And on the next series of slides, we just kind of cover a few of these topics. Tuberculosis should always be considered as a cause of an undiagnosed pleural effusion. And Getting back to this concept of serosal TB, the pathogenesis is a subplural focus, ruptures in the plural space. You have to think about TB. I'm going to spare you a lot of the, the other details in this. Tuberculous peritonitis, uh, Arnold Rich and McCormick demonstrated that in every case of tuberculous meningitis, they could find a little tubercle just beneath the arachnoid mater in the brain, a subependymal <laughs> tubercle that ruptured in the subarachnoid space. And I can, if I take a, a healthy tuberculin positive medical student and then we do a spinal tap and inject some PPD, we will mimic the syndrome of tuberculous meningitis. So always think TB in a case of meningitis. Pericarditis. Uh, you have a lymph node adjacent to pericardium that ruptures in the pericardial sac. Before the days of echocardiography, this could be a very tough diagnosis, constrictive pericarditis presenting as, as heart failure. High mortality without treatment, treat, surgical treatment is to remove the entire pericardium. Tuberculous peritonitis uh, is a tough diagnosis and where it really comes into play is you got somebody with cirrhosis of the liver and ascites, the term for fluid in the abdomen. There are two opposite types, of a lot of fluid or just a tiny bit of fluid looking like a so-called doughy abdomen. So that's a biggie. Tuberculous arthritis, a lot less common, usually one joint. In adults, it tends to involve the spine, vertebral osteomyelitis, and that's big. It's known as Potts disease. And why would that be so important? Because it could compress the spinal cord, right, and lead to paralysis.
So that's uh, very important. Genesis of urinary TB, tubercle of the glomerulus, ruptures in the calocele system, very insidious onset. Osteomyelitis, we've uh, talked about a little bit before. We've talked about Pott's disease. All these topics are huge topics. Tuberculosis of the adrenal glands, usual cause, was described by Thomas Addison. I think I showed a few of those of you in my ethics group the slides. If anybody wants to see them, I'll be happy to show them to you if, if you'd like. Would anybody like to go up into the, the rare book room sometime and see some of these things? Raise your hand. No? Nobody? <laughs> nobody? <laughs> nobody, okay. So much for medical history. Just, just see some, uh, look at the facsimile editions and see Thomas Addison's original drawings of TB of the renal glands, for example. It'll take about 10 minutes. Excuse me? No, not now. No, no, just, I don't, I don't have the keys right now. Just at some time during these lectures. Anybody like to do that? Okay, well, I'll, I'll bring the keys one day. We'll do it, uh, we'll do it during the break or, uh, we could do it during the break even. TB and HIV positive people, we talked about earlier, uh, can precede the diagnosis of TB. Oftentimes, uh, resembles progressive primary TB. So when people come in with TB and, and they nearly always have pneumocystis pneumonia as a cause of diffuse infiltrates, we, we have to rule out TB with some smears. Diagnosis of TB is uh, tough. We speak of this organism as a red snapper. It's acid fast. And why is it acid fast? It's got this very thick uh, waxy raincoat made up of lipids primarily. It allows it to uh, not decolorize when acid is put on, whereas most things are going to decolorize. Uh, we look at the AFB smear to see whether we, if we can find it on the smear. These are AFBs on smears. This is a fluorescent method. It shows better. We do tuberculin skin tests. What we look at is the enduration, not the erythema. You feel it. And it turns out that uh, if this is the size of the reaction. 10 millimeters used to be the cutoff of the TB skin test. Today, we have uh, arranged a hierarchy of criteria as follows. If a healthy medical student, an uh, ordinary healthy person, has a tuberculosis skin test, we insist on 15 millimeters before we would treat. If somebody has evidence of disease, we would bring it down to 10. And if somebody had HIV infection, we'd bring it down to 5. So it's, we don't insist on 10 millimeters as a one-size-fits-all dimension anymore. That was standardized only for survey uh, populations. And this is uh, shown on this slide here, what I just told you. And there's some rapid ways to do it. Any questions about TB? We're going to go fairly rapidly over the uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria. One can argue that in the world of mycobacteria, TB is really the atypical one. The rest of them are not quite so dangerous. And there are different terms for non-tuberculous mycobacteria, MOT or mycobacteria other than TB, atypical mycobacteria, NTM or non-tuberculous mycobacteria. Those abbreviations are, of course, unimportant. The main thing is the concept. There are numerous species. Mycobacteria are everywhere. It is suggested this one, uh, MAC, Mycobacterium avium intracellulare, which you may have had in HIV, uh, talking about that lecture, MAC, or the avium intracellulare complex, because it's really a group of organisms, has become important. And in non-immunocompromised people, interestingly, it used to be mainly a disease that we saw in white male cigarette smokers, but now it's becoming a disease of women, particularly tall, thin women, some of whom have a pectus excavatum or mitral valve prolapse. And it's suggested by my friend Michael Eisman, who's out at National Jewish, that the reason for this, that we're seeing this, is uh, showers, that people don't take baths anymore, they take showers. And 
By law, you can't get the temperature of the water above 120 degrees, so that when you take a shower, you may be aerosolizing MAC in, into your lungs, which is an interesting thought, isn't it? Uh, Mycobacterium avimetracellulae was very common in AIDS patients when their CD4 counts get extremely low, which tells you that this organism is, is widespread. Uh, looking at uh, pulmonary disease, these mycobacteria can cause pulmonary disease, and the two most famous ones there are MAC, MAV metrocellulari, and Mycobacterium hanzaceae, which is expected in the West. And the deal with these organisms is that uh, they're not as aggressive as TB, but are much harder to treat. When I saw a slide like this early in the AIDS epidemic, I knew we were in a lot of trouble because MAV metrocellulari or MAC tends to uh, stay in the lung, but all of a sudden we began to see it elsewhere. This is a bone marrow in which these cells are just red because their cytoplasm is just nothing but, it's been, it's been taken over, commandeered by these organisms. Uh, and so in AIDS we see disseminated MAC, fever, weight loss, hepatitis plenomegaly, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to see that come up in clinical medicine. Uh, the non-tuberculous mycobacteria cause a lot of other diseases. Uh, scrofula is their involvement of lymph nodes. Scrofula is also used as a term for TB in lymph nodes, mainly in children. And as the name suggests, in addition to MAC, M. scrofulaceum. Uh, this fellow had disease in the knee, for example, and that turned out to be uh, atypical mycobacterium. One to remember for boards in life is mycobacterium marinum, which suggests water, correct? And so the question, mark this well for your exam, etc., would be somebody who cleans out a fish tank, for example, or owns a fish store and comes in with this nodule at the site of trauma that evolves into an abscess. It may cause lesions going up and down this person had rheumatoid arthritis and an unusual mycobacterium. That was mycobacterium chelonii. And there are certain rapidly growing mycobacteria that can uh, infect uh, people, particularly as opportunists or after infections or wounds. An older classification of the non-tuberculous mycobacteria was to look at it as being the photochromogens, which grew, developed pigment in the uh, in, in light, scotochromogens, which formed a pigment in the dark, non-chromogens, and then the rapid growers. Any questions about tuberculosis at all? We're going to close with just a couple of remarks about leprosy, what you need to know about leprosy clinically. As you know, the organism has never been successfully cultured. Armadillos, which we're beginning to see in South Carolina, right along the highways. How many of you have seen a dead armadillo on the road? A bunch of you? So it's coming this way, like the, uh, uh, what is it, the uh, African killer bee and fire ants. It's coming up this way. Uh, it infects especially the skin and peripheral nerves, leprosy does. And if you do, I once went to a leprosarium for fun, and uh, they, would, they did thermograms of the body. And if you look at the body and look at what parts is cool or cooler, leprosy goes after the cooler areas of the body. The areas of the face out here on the surface and over the sinuses, over the frontal area tend to be the coolest areas. The nerves are involved tend to be the most superficial nerves are the coolest. The uh, testicles, of course, are, are cool by design. Uh, and the, the main thing to know about leprosy, I think, is to, to understand the disease conceptually is, are the two polar types, the tuberculoid leprosy on the one hand and lepromatous leprosy on the other. Tuberculoid leprosy, as the name implies, uh, is tuberculosis-like. Think of tuberculosis immunity. These people have partial immunity. 
And so it doesn't cause the, the typical appearance of a, of a leper with the messed up leonine face. Uh, and a hallmark of uh, tuberculosis leprosy early on is a large anesthetic plaque. So if any of you find somebody with a rash, a plaque, and you had the presence of mind to, to see whether light touch and pinprick sensation are present in it and it's not there, i.e. you've identified an anesthetic plaque, you suggest leprosy, let me know and we'll give you a, a ticker tape parade down Garner's Ferry Road because that's, uh, that would be hitting a home run with the bases loaded, tuberculosis leprosy. Lepromatous leprosy, on the other hand, these people are energic. And as a result of that, they get massive infiltration of the dermis, which causes their, their facial features to be distorted, sort of like in acromegaly. You just get coarsening of the facial features. And what happens to them, because their T lymphocytes are powerless, their B lymphocytes try to compensate and do something about it, which results in massive production of antibodies, which leads to hyperglobulinemia, and also can lead to some unusual phenomena, of which the more famous ones are having a false positive serological test for syphilis and developing a secondary amyloidosis. Amyloidosis. And that's the end of the slide show. If this lecture can be dignified as being called a show, and uh, I'm going to, uh, any questions that you have?